Um, uh, so Amcaso could you have been uh, coming to camp since uh, 2002, I believe, where it was held on, Princeton, uh, on Princeton campus. Um, and um, since then, I, uh, I moved to the University of Maryland. And uh, this coming year, I'll be uh, at uh, MIT, where I'm going to be a visiting MLK professor. So I want to talk about some of the work that I've done in time frequency analysis over the last few years. Um, uh, I call it promenade in time frequency analysis because I'll touch upon a few things that I've done. Um, and the plan is uh, to go through like um, uh, what I view as time frequency analysis. So this can sort of be defined in many different ways by many different people. So the focus of the talk will be uh, a system of function that's called GABO system. And I'll talk about GABO analysis. Uh, that will be the motivation of uh, pretty much everything that's to come. And uh, for the last part of the talk, I'll talk about um, uh, two problems in, uh, in this area that's uh, very interesting, and especially the last one. And uh, in fact, it's one of the first problems that uh, my uh, PhD advisor, Chris Heil at Georgia Tech, uh, gave me when I was a graduate student. And um, I was very naive to think that the problem was easy. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, I couldn't believe it that uh, no one could solve that kind of problem. I'll state it in a minute. It doesn't require any so mathematical sophistication to understand what the problem is. Uh, however, it's a very difficult problem. I spent pretty much every summer since graduate school trying to work on this problem. <laughs> and uh, only maybe two years ago, I sort of uh, made some of the ideas sort of uh, come to fruition. I can't say that I solve it all, but uh, I think I sort of have some, uh, some idea to sort of look at the problem a little bit more. So I'll share with you what I have so far. Um, and uh, it's a very fun problem. It, in fact, I believe it's uh, very addictive. So if I state it, you might just sort of get hooked by it, okay? <laughs> Which I'm hoping you'll do. All right. So uh, the way I view time frequency analysis, it's uh, the analysis of uh, function or signal. So there are various ways to define a function or a signal. So one way will be to sort of define the function in the space domain or in time domain, or to define the function in frequency domain. And usually you do this with uh, the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform will sort of be normalized uh, using this formula right here. Um, it's uh, known that the Fourier transform is an isometry on L2 of R. So it preserves the inner product and it preserves the norm of every function. So if I view f of t as representing like the temporal or special information about or content about a function, then the Fourier transform gives you the frequency content about that function exactly. In fact, if you put two pi values, you're not <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, so uh, and also I come from a school where if I don't put the two pi, my mathematical father will not be happy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, all right, so. Um, this is going to be the setting, the definition of a Fourier transform. And uh, the very first problem that I think sort of uh, can be viewed as a foundation of time frequency analysis, at least what I'll be talking about, is a claim by von Neumann in 1932, who claimed that the following system of functions. So let me sort of uh, pause for a minute and sort of make sure that we all see what it is. So he takes the Gaussian, OK, e to a power minus pi t squared, probably the better function you can think of, OK? So very smooth. It sort of uh, have exactly the same form in the time domain as in the frequency domain. Goes to 0 very fast. Uh, so he claimed that if you take that function and shift the function along the z lattice in one direction and modulate the function by this exponential with frequency k, then he claimed that this should sort of form a tensor space of L2 of r. So by densor space of L2 of R, we mean that when you take the set of uh, finite linear combination, you take the closure, you should get uh, the whole L2 of R uh, out of this. So he did not prove this. It was proved a couple of decades later by a, a group of people independently by these two groups. And uh, about 10 years after John Ma uh, no, no, von Neumann claimed, uh, Danny Gabor, who is a physicist and also an electrical engineer, and uh, made essentially the, f the same claim. So in fact, he went a step beyond what, uh, what uh, John uh, von Neumann sort of uh, did. He said every L2 function should have this sort of series expansion. Now, he did not sort of make very specific what kind of convergence he's talking about here. But he just sort of said that it's reasonable to sort of think that if you take the Gaussian g, you shift it on z, and you multiply by this exponential, you should be able to reconstruct every function in this form. Now, it's clear that if this is true, then you can more or less sort of see that this has to be true. 
but uh, what kind of convergence do you have? And uh, that's sort of something that was left open. Now, you have to also keep in mind that uh, because of his background, what Gabo was thinking about was something that sort of will mimic the Fourier series decomposition of a function. So you give me a function in space. I can sort of, uh, if the function is uh, square integrable on the interval 0, 1, then I can write it as a Fourier series. So I write it as the coefficient are going to just be the inner product of f with each of these exponential, and I'll put them combined with the exponential and get my function back. And this convergence will be in the L2 sense. So in his background, or in, in his mind, Gabo was thinking about being able to compute this coefficient CK exactly the same way you would do like a Fourier transfer. And so why would you sort of think that this kind of decomposition is possible in the first place? Why do you want to sort of use a Gaussian? That's where I want to sort of uh, pick up, OK? And by the way, if there is any question, please stop me. I'll sort of be glad to go over this. All right, so uh, the first thing that I want to sort of uh, bring to your attention is that if I change the Gaussian and take the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1, so this is a function that's going to take the value 1 between 0 and 1 and 0 everywhere else, then it's not too difficult to convince ourselves that the set of uh, functions that I obtain by sort of shifting this function along the z lattice and multiplying it by this exponential is an orthonormal basis for the whole L2 of R. So to see it is quite simple. So this is exactly the Fourier series that I gave you earlier, because uh, when I take the exponential and restrict it to the interval 0, 1, which is worth multiplying it by the g of t, which is just a characteristic function of 0, 1, that's exactly what it's doing. This becomes an orthonormal basis of uh, L2 of 0, 1. Now, there is nothing specific about the interval 0, 1. I can just shift the interval 0, 1 by any integer. So that's what this is sort of supposed to do. When I shift it by any integer, I'll have an orthonormal basis for L2 of the interval going from k to k plus 1. Now, because this interval are disjoint, or sort of uh, the, the, the intersection is a set of measure 0, then by combining all these pieces together, it's not difficult to see that, in fact, you get an, an orthonormal basis of L2 of R. So in particular, what Gabo was trying to do is possible if, instead of using the Gaussian, and we'll come back to that, if instead of using the Gaussian, you put your, uh, the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1 there, then this decomposition is true. It's converged in L2, and I know exactly how to compute this coefficient. They're just going to be the inner product of my function f against this function right here. So it's exactly a Fourier series decomposition. But the only thing is that I'm doing a localized Fourier series decomposition. I take my function. I localize it with a function g, which is a characteristic function of the interval 0, 1. I expand it in a Fourier series, and then I put all of them together to get my function back. That's essentially what's sort of going on here. Okay. Now, it's easy that I could do it quite straightforward uh, when I use uh, the characteristic function of the interval 0, 1. But can I do the same thing with a Gaussian? That's a question that Gabo asked, and that's where I'm going to sort of go back to now. So uh, I just need to sort of introduce a terminology here. So for a function g in L2 of r and for two parameters, uh, positive a and b, the collection of functions which are time frequency shift of g along the lattice az and BZ. So all I'm doing is I'm sort of uh, dividing the real line on one hand on interval of length A, OK? And I'm dividing the second piece of the real line, which is the y-axis, on interval of length B. And then I shift my function along the x direction by A multiple of uh, A. And then I shift it along the y-axis by multiple of B, essentially. That's what this is. So the example that I gave you earlier where the case where a is equal to 1, and B is equal to 1. But here, I'm allowing A and B to be like any number, essentially. Okay. So this set of function is called a Garbo system, or a Weiss-Heisenberg system. G, uh, it's called the generator, and A and B are the parameters. So given any function G in L2, any parameter A and B, you can always form this system. And the example that we had was that for G equal to characteristic function of 0, 1, A equal to B equal to 1, we know that this form an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. Now, what about the original question that I had? And so I have not answered that question. So we'll, we'll come back to that. OK? So hope everything is clear so far. So a Gabo system is given by three data, the function g, the parameter a, and the parameter b. I only require that the two parameters are positive, at least for now. And then we're going to see what's important about them in a minute. <coughs> Now, this is the first bad news for the Gabo system. So if the 
GABO system G with any G, with parameter A equal 1, B equal 1, if this is an orthonormal basis, then this product has to be equal to infinity. Now, for those people who are familiar a little bit with physics, this side right here is exactly the measure of uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, right? We know that this quantity is always bounded below by a constant, which is like 1 over 16 pi squared, I think, if I have my normalization correct. So this quantity is always bounded below. But what this is saying is that as soon as this system becomes an orthonormal basis of L2 of R, then the uncertainty has to be maximized. This has to sort of be infinity. This product has to be infinity. So it sort of rule out the Gaussian because for the Gaussian, this is a finite number right here. Okay. So what Gabo had in mind is not possible. It might be possible in a different sense, but you cannot sort of use a equal to b to make this an orthonormal basis because of this theorem. And this theorem is called the Balian Law theorem, proven independently by Balian and Law in the eighties. All right, so what can you get if uh, instead of, uh, of this? So you have to sort of pay a price. So if I want to sort of uh, do something, I need to sort of weaken the definition of orthonormal basis to go to something that could sort of allow me to do everything I can still do with an orthonormal basis, but try to actually beat that theorem that we had on the board over there. Okay, And that's the notion of frame. So for a given function g and the parameter a and b, the Gabo system is going to be called a frame. So that's the keyword here, a frame for L2 of r if I can find two positive constant a and b so that this inequality holds. So I want you to observe that if this was an orthonormal basis, then this is going to be an equality with a equal to b equal to 1. Okay. So what this is telling you is telling you that you can still decompose your function into a series, hopefully, involving this coefficient. The coefficient will capture almost the norm of a function up to these two constant a and b. So you're losing your the orthogonality is lost. However, everything about the function is still captured by this coefficient right here. Okay. So the next thing that you might want to ask me is, is this enough to actually do a decomposition and the reconstruction of your function? And the answer is yes. So this is going to be called a Gabo frame for now on. And uh, the following theorem tells you that if you have a Gabo frame for L2 of R, I can always find a function that I'm going to call the canonical dual function, G tilde, which is going to generate a frame with the same parameter, but the bound are going to be flipped. Now the bound will be 1 over B, 1 over A, and this is going to be called the canonical dual frame, so that F can have this decomposition right here. So in other words, I can do almost everything I can do with an orthonormal basis at the price of changing the function with which I'm analyzing or the function with which I'm reconstructing my function. If this was an orthonormal basis, then this g tilde will be exactly equal to g. So here, I'm using a different set of functions to analyze my data and reconstructing with a different set of functions. And there are infinitely many g tilde that you can choose to make this. The g tilde that I'm going to choose here is a canonical one in the sense that it's the one that's going to give you the minimum L2 norm on this coefficient right here. Okay? So that's why I'm going to call it a canonical dual here. Okay? Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah, help me understand. So with the G tilde, it, I can still reconstruct the original function up to some noise? There'll be some noise? Yes, so essentially what you'll be saying is that if you give me any sort of uh, precision, yeah. I can sort of find finitely many of these guys to sort of make it sort of uh, so that the difference in uh, L2 sense goes to zero. That's what I've, I'm saying. And you sort of touch upon a very important point here. The quality of your reconstruction will depend on the quality of your G and therefore the quality of your G tilde. So one question you might ask, if you take G to be, let's say, the Gaussian, will the reconstructing function also be like as nice as the Gaussian? So the exactly. The and so I'll touch upon a little bit on that uh, uh, to, toward the end of the talk. But the answer is yes, you might be able to sort of do this. OK. But it's, it's actually non-trivial to actually guarantee to begin with that whatever window you start from, then you're going to have a window that's going to be as nice as that one. So, so is, are these Gs like? Are these like convolution type operators? So you have, you're kind of moving this Wendt Gaussian across the function and kind of using Yes, it's, it's, like a, it's almost like a convolution. So the way you want to think about it is, so suppose you have like, a, I don't know, this is your f that you want to analyze. And uh, what you want to do, you want to localize it. So you take a Gaussian. So let's say you take a Gaussian.
And then you start shifting the Gaussian around. And so you pick the Gaussian, let's say shift it to this point, let's say this is your x. You have a piece of a Gaussian that's going to sort of be here. And what you're going to be doing is essentially a Fourier series decomposition of a part of a function that live essentially in the essential support of a Gaussian. And then you put them together. That's essentially what you're doing. So that's what these coefficients are computing. And then you get a function similar to that one to actually do the reconstruction. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So this is uh, a theorem that tells you that you can always do this for, I mean, not always. There are G and A and B for which this is true. And the question that you might want to ask me is, can you give me an example? And is a Gaussian one of these examples? And uh, that's what I'm going to say. But before I say that, I want to sort of mention a theorem that says the following. So this is actually a very important theorem. I view it as a, an equivalent of a Nyquist theorem for sampling. So Nyquist theorem in sampling theory says that uh, there is a rate under which you can sort of sample and reconstruct perfectly. And uh, after that rate, you cannot sample and reconstruct perfectly. You'll have like aliasing. And this is almost exactly the same thing. So if you give me a GABO system, if it's an orthonormal basis, then this product that I showed you earlier must be infinity. OK? And this is an if and only if statement. So sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, I didn't say it right. So if it's an orthonormal basis, the product of the parameter A and B must be equal to 1. And in this case, this quantity must be infinity. OK? So whenever I have an orthonormal basis, it can only happen if the product of A and B is equal to 1. And that's why Gabo was actually interested in the case A equal to B equal to 1, because he wants the orthonormal basis. However, that's not possible because of the Balian law theorem. So orthonormal basis can be achieved only when A and B the product is equal to 1. And essentially, that gives you just a class of function that looks like the characteristic function of the interval 0 to 1. Okay. Now, if the product of AB is bigger than 1, this is never going to be a frame. And if the product of AB is less than 1, then you can find frames that are going to be very smooth. In fact, you can find frames, all of the frames that you find will sort of beat this uncertainty principle here. So the key parameter in GABO system is a product of A and B, or rather the inverse of A and B, which is the density of your lattice. So if your lattice is dense enough, you can reconstruct. If your so this one, if you like take 1 over AB is less than 1, you cannot reconstruct. 1 over AB is bigger than 1. It means that your lattice is dense enough. And this one, AB equal to 1, is exactly the case where the lattice is exactly dense at a critical density. And that's when you can only have an orthonormal basis. So for now on, okay, me, yes. No, but you can, you can uh, more or less, you can construct like a, uh, a pseudo differential operator for which these are going to be like an eigen, an eigen basis. So from now on, I'm actually going to go away from this case because this is a bad case, right? Because I can never do anything nice. I cannot sort of give, if you want to use a function as nice as a Gaussian, you have to sort of live away from AB equal to 1. So I'm going to set myself into the case where the product of AB is less than 1. Okay. All right, so here are some example of Gabo system. So for the Gaussian, it turns out that the Gaussian with any parameter AB is a frame if and only if AB is strictly less than 1. So if you give me any A and B so that the product of A and B is less than 1, then I can guarantee you that the Gaussian is going to give you a frame. Okay? Again, I cannot reach AB equal to 1 because in that case, I have to have an orthonormal basis, but that's not possible. Okay? Uh, if you give me this function, which is a maximum of 1 over uh, one, uh, 1 minus t and, uh, and 0, so the function that I'm talking about is just a hard function. It's just the function that's uh, minus 1, 1. And this is the same thing as uh, convolving the characteristic function of minus 1 half, 1 half with itself. And I'll come back to this later again. OK, so this is exactly the same as convolving like the characteristic function of a function with itself. So if you give me that function with uh, a equal to b, a 1, and b equal to 1 half, then the system that I get will be a Gabo system. And in fact, I can find like very smooth function. And I um, mean, function that has as nice as continuous, the function and the Fourier transform will be in L2 and test set L1, so that for some a, b, this is going to be a frame. So the question that you might probably ask yourself is, if I give you g, 
can you give me all the AB for which this is uh, going to be a frame? And that's a very interesting question, and that's one of the questions that I'd like to talk about toward the end of the talk, OK? So you can sort of uh, keep this in mind as we're going along. All right, so what can you do with this space? So this space uh, uh, so with uh, the, uh, the GABO system. So GABO system sort of came around the same time as a uh, wavelet system. And wavelet systems have had like a lot of application in uh, signal processing, in image compression, and image analysis. And in particular, one of the nice things about like wavelet bases is that they provide like an orthonormal basis or a basis for natural signal. Like many images are naturally decomposable into basis of a wavelet. And so around the time when the theory of wavelet was uh, being developed, the notion of GABO system also sort of uh, started sort of taking off. And Feichinger uh, from Vienna sort of defined a class of function. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this. He called this function like modulation spaces. They are defined with two parameters. You fix a window, uh, a Gaussian, and you look at uh, the inner product of, uh, you look at this integral essentially, which is essentially computing the Fourier transform of a function, but you're localizing the Fourier transform. That's exactly the same thing that I've been computing earlier, OK? So you claim, uh, you said that the temperature distribution is in this modulation space if this integral, if this integral is finite. I don't want to sort of get too much into the detail here. It's a little bit technical. But the point that I would like to make is that these are sort of very natural s s s uh, function space that are completely understood by the behavior of a GABO coefficient in this setting. So in other words, what I would like to sort of say is, and uh, I don't want to spend too much time in here, is that the notion of frame that I just developed is actually a notion that's sort of very typical for Hilbert space theory. However, you can extend this to a Banach setting, a Banach space setting, by realizing that this space are Banach space. And if you have a GABO frame for L2 of R, then you might be able to sort of use this to decompose function in this Banach space as well. And in particular, a function will be in a modulation space if a frame coefficient are in some sequence space. And that's exactly sort of uh, the notion that uh, Feichinger and the Gorknik developed around the 90s. So I'm not going to sort of spend uh, time on this. Uh, one other thing that I work on myself was to look at uh, the decomposition of function in a different say, space. It's called uh, Wiener amalgam space, which is a space of function that are locally in LP and globally in LQ. And uh, it's possible, actually, to do the same thing that I just sort of described. Given a function in this space, I can find a sequence that's going to completely describe a function and give you perfect reconstruction, essentially. OK. And uh, to sort of finish the general uh, thing about like GABO system, I just want to mention something that Robert sort of alluded to earlier. So if I have a GABO frame, how nice is uh, the dual? How nice can I make the dual? So it turns out that when the, the, your original function is a Schwarz function, which is a very small function, then you can actually choose the canonical dual to also be in the same place. And uh, in, um, in 2003, this class of function M11, which is exactly the same as the space that I call here modulation space with p equal to 1, q equal to 1, it was known for a long time that this is a very nice class of window function to do GABO analysis. They are not smooth. They all continuous. And uh, they sort of give you like a, a little bit sort of better result in terms of uh, time frequency content. I mean, this, you cannot beat this, but this is actually a little bit bigger. You have more function in this space. And uh, in 2003, uh, Gorkning and Leonard proved that if your generator is in M1, then the canonical dual will be in M1. And uh, this one is of a space corresponding to p equal to infinity, q equal to 1 here. And uh, it's larger than all these two spaces. And uh, recently, with uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Ilya Kristol, we proved that if a generator is on W infinity 1, then the canonical dual will be also be in W infinity 1. So you can expect that if you have a nice class of function that are generator, then the dual, you can almost guarantee that the dual will also be in those space. Okay. All right, so that's, uh, that's the end of the first part of the talk. And now I would like to sort of come to some of the questions that I've sort of been looking at uh, in recent years. So this one is called the frame set of a function. So Given a function in L2, for what parameter a, b will this generate a GABO system? Pretty simple function, right? So I give you the, the example of a Gaussian. The Gaussian is a, a frame as long as the product of a, b is less than 1. Okay? So we can sort of begin by noticing something. If you're looking at a GABO system, 
then the hyperbola AB equal one is a critical thing in your domain. You can never get anything beyond this place because you're not going to have a frame. So if you expect to have a frame, this is the place to sort of look for parameter. And will you always get the entire set or will you get only a subset of this one? And that's the question that this is trying to sort of address here. Okay. So I'm going to call the frame set of uh, G, and this is the definition of the frame set of G, the set of all parameters that are non-negative so that uh, the system generated by G and AB is a frame for L2 of R. Again, it has to be a subset of, uh, of this domain. And the question is, can we sort of uh, do anything? So we've been talking about Garbo frame for more than 20 years now. And uh, this is pretty much the list of all functions for which you can actually determine what the frame set is. So the Gaussian, I show you the Gaussian earlier. One over hyperbolic cosine, <coughs> one side exponential. Um, this is uh, the exponential of absolute value of uh, x. So for all this set, the domain is uh, the entire full set here. Everything under that hyperbola will give you a Gabo system. And uh, more recently, Gokning and uh, a few of his collaborators sort of work on this case. These are class of uh, totally positive function of finite type. And the functions are given in the Fourier domain by this sort of expression. And uh, in fact, what you'll think to be one of the easiest one turn out to be one of the most difficult one. If I give you the characteristic function of an interval, for what parameter a and b can this be a tight or can be this be a frame? It took several years to finally have this solved. It was solved like uh, maybe two or three years ago by uh, uh, Dai and Son in a very very long paper. They were able to sort of settle it, and the set is very very complicated. It's not the entire set. It sort of depends on uh, some of the uh, number theory property of a number A, B, and C that are involved here. So this is a very complicated set. And uh, once you sort of do this, your next natural question is, what happens when you take the convolution of two intervals? And uh, you have like the hard function. Can you do essentially something about it? <coughs> and that's something that uh, I've been working on with some of my collaborators. So um, uh, Atindeu is a graduate student in Benin, so he visited like the University of Maryland last fall, and that's when we start uh, doing this work. We have some results that I'm going to show. And uh, I'm co-advising him with Kwagu uh, uh, Yebeni, and sadly, uh, Yebe uh, Atindeu will defend in about two weeks, but his co-advisor passed away like uh, Saturday last week, so he's, uh, it's a very sad story. So. Uh, but uh, this is a result that he got, we got like when he was at Maryland, that if you take the function that I described earlier, which is a hard function, the, com uh, the, ca uh, the convolution of the characteristic function of one half, one half, then we have like a, sus uh, a subset of, of the frame set. So rather than going through it, I'll go through the picture. So everything except the red part is uh, part of the frame set. So for the, for the, the function that I just wrote down, it's known that nothing in this domain will be like inside the frame set, okay? This one will be the case where you have an orthonormal basis. That was known by, it's done by, it's work done by Dobeshi like in the early 90s. The yellow part was done by uh, a group of people from Denmark as well as the blue part and uh, this part right here. And what we add to it in our result is uh, this like, uh, I think this is cyan. And uh, the result that I just presented is uh, this, this part right there. So it's, uh, it's still very complicated. It involves a lot of, uh, lot of computation, uh, but also uh, potentially it sort of uh, point out a way to actually look at this in a more general sense. And the hyperbola that I have here, I let them here uh, to sort of highlight that the way we solve or uh, we obtain this point is actually to show that there is a continuum family of hyperbola. And along each of these hyperbolic domain, you can completely determine whether or not you have like a frame or not a frame just by looking at um, the invertibility of a given matrix. And uh, one of the things that we did in our work was we were able, using our method, to unify everything that has been done so far. So we've seen that there is a single matrix that governs essentially whether or not you have a, mate, uh, a frame here. There is a single one that governs pretty much all the way here, and one that governs uh, all the way to this one. But so far, we have not been able to complete this small piece of the domain here. So uh, this is still work in progress, but um, very, very excited about what we, we, we've been doing so far. Uh, so do you think that shape, you can make it like, uh, 
completed and closure on that? Um, yeah, I think, I think. Conjecture, there's more there. Maybe. Yes, actually, so, so vi there is a, this red line right here, right? So two, anything on that line will not be a frame. And then there is a red line here, three. And in fact, on any integer along this line, there is a red line. So I believe it's more complicated than that. But what I believe we can do is to close at least this portion right here. I believe everything in this piece is, uh, is going to be like a frame. But so far, we have not been able to, to achieve that. Uh, It's an infinite dimension. So you essentially you write the duality equation, and you end up sort of having to solve like a functional equation. And then you want like a, an infinite matrix to sort of be invertible. But you only need a small piece of it. So with uh, this decomposition, we're able to actually pick like a, the right size of sub matrix to invert. But then in general, we don't know how to sort of uh, complete this one. Okay. And here is, uh, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but uh, here is an example of a dual for the system. So if I know it's a frame, this is an example of a dual function that you can use. You can already see that this is bad because I start from a function that continues, but the dual is discontinuous. Okay, But um, I mean, not too bad, like uh, pretty smooth almost everywhere, essentially, I'd say. Okay. All right, so for the last maybe 10, 15 minutes, I'll talk about the addictive problem that I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, uh, It's called the HRT conjecture. It's uh, named after Heil, Ramanathan, and Topiwala in IDCs. And the problem is very simple. It says, given any function in L2 of R non-zero, any set of finitely many points in R2, the collection of uh, this function, which is you translate by AK, you modulate by BK, so you only have finitely many functions. This is linearly independent in L2 of R. So let me write it more explicitly so that we all clear about what I mean here. So given any non-zero L2 function, if you have a set of coefficient complex numbers so that this is zero almost everywhere, can you conclude that all the coefficients are zero? So this is a problem that I believe, I mean, you, you see it, it's, it sounds like linear algebra. It's, uh, yes, this you're talking about infinitely many uh, function in L2 of R, but at the end of the day, you're only looking at finitely many points here. So you, can you sort of say that these functions are linearly independent? And the conjecture is yes, they have to be. But so far, there is no solution to this, OK? Um, first time I saw it, I said, no, nothing can be easier than this. So you start working on it, and then you believe you can get something, and then you keep just learning. That's how I view it, OK? So you learn a lot when you do this. So what's, uh, what can you do about this? So uh, if you want to check out our talk, if you think like I'm saying something that does not make sense, I'm giving you three examples here. These are four functions. Pick your favorite class of function, L2 of R, or the Schwarz function. And if you want to work for the last few minutes, determine whether or not this, is like, uh, this set is linearly independent. Okay? So there are three functions here. So um, let me see. So I'll use different colors. So the first one is that you take the origin. You take 1, 0. You take uh, square root of 2, square root of 2, 0. So this is 1. Let's say 2 is here, square root of 2. Square root of 2 is there. And then the other one is 0, 1. So I take a function. I shift the function in space by nothing here, that g of x. I shift it by 1. I shift it by square root of 2. And I modulate the function by exponential of 2 pi i x. And I'm asking you. Are these functions linearly independent? Do they form a linearly independent set? And then for the second one, I do the same thing, except that for here, instead of just doing square root of 2, I also modulate by square root of 2. So instead of having the point down here, I just push the point a little bit up here. That's what the second one is. And the third one is almost exactly the same thing. But except of using square root of 2, I decide to use a number here, which is pi. So I push it a little bit up with pi here. Okay. You can already see that some number theory will have to sort of come into play here. I mean, because I'm using these numbers, and they have to sort of be something for, for this reason. But the key here is that it's in L2. The key is in L2, because if it's a bounded function, if it's in L infinity, then you can do this easily. So the key is in L2. However, what I also want to point out is that even if you assume that your function is very smooth, the problem is still non-trivial. Okay. 
All right, so let me list the known results about this conjecture. And, um, and then you'll see why it seems difficult. So these two are exactly the same statement. So pure translate, you take the modulation to be just a constant value. So you're just translating function. You can do this using Fourier technique. You just take the function, take the Fourier transform of your equation. You're going to have a polynomial multiplied by a non-zero function is zero. A polynomial can be zero only when it's, uh, it's uh, on, on uh, non-trivial interval when the coefficients are all zero. So that's sort of trivial. Now, suppose you do something a little bit worse than just putting them on a straight line. You put all of them on a straight line but one, like this one here. So remove this and do this. Put one of the line, OK? But then I want you to sort of see, the one that are on the same line, I also want them to be equispaced. So they have to have equal distance to each other. So this is not covered by this case. So here is one, but the distance here is square root of 2 minus 1. So if all of them are on the same line, equispace, but then one is out, you can still use essentially the same technique in here to put that they have to be linearly independent. So that one is known. So if a set of points is a subset of a lattice, so if you can write them as, let's say, a matrix A multiplied by Z2, then yes, you can also do it. So in particular, any set of three points can be put in a lattice in two dimensions, and therefore the conjecture is true for any set of three points. So you can see why I didn't give you a set of three points. So I give you four points, OK? So that's uh, one of the reasons. So for three points is known. Uh, if a function is compactly supported, it's also known. Com supported on a half interval, that's fine. If a function is a Gaussian or, in fact, a Hermit polynomial, the, function, the theorem is known. And uh, so because of this statement for the Gaussian, people start sort of exploring what sort of decay you need in order to have this happen. So for function that decay for this type, the uh, exponential, a little bit better than like a log x log x, then the conjecture is known to be true. <coughs> and uh, there are a few new results where you have to sort of assume something about the function and assume something about the point, and these are sort of two results. So in particular, for four points, but then you have to assume a lot about the, the function, then the result is, is known. So when I saw this, my first thing is, OK, if you can do it for three points, what's sort of preventing you to do it for four points? So that's, I mean, if you cannot do four points, then you should just sort of uh, not do it at all. <laughs> and and uh, so this is what's known for four points. So uh, for any L2 function, it's true for four points. But the four point has to be in a very special configuration. They have to be in such a way that two of the points are on a line, and the other two are on a parallel line. So I'll pick like two points. So that's why I did not put, when I had this one, I did not put the four point here. If I had put it here, it will work. In fact, anywhere on this line, I can do it for any L2 function. So if you search, put it anywhere else, then this is unknown, OK? If a point in, in uh, if a function is a short function and the points are in a one-free configuration, meaning that three of them are on one line and then one is off the line, but now the key difference here is that, yes, I can allow this kind of configuration because I'm no longer sort of worrying about the distance between the points. So if one point is off the line and the function is shor a short function, then this is known. And in fact, recently it's been proved that the conjecture is true for every L2 function for almost all one free, uh, one free configuration. It means that pretty much for every point that's sort of uh, in one free configuration, this is, uh, this is true. And I'll come back to this because I have like uh, an improvement or sort of uh, a more refined version of this, of this result. But then in general, if you sort of give me like arbitrarily four points that do not fall into this category, then the conjecture is completely open. Okay. Can you say almost all in measure? In, instead, of, instead of measure. All right, so the question, the way I sort of finally sort of start looking at the question is the following. I know the conjecture is true for three points. You give me one point. Can I tell you, OK, this is a set of points that you can never touch. Can you do it that way? Can you exclude some point? Can you give me, if I give you three points, can you tell me which four point will never work? OK, so in general, the way I would like to phrase it is that suppose somebody tells me that, oh, the conjecture is true for some end point. Can you characterize a set of all? point so that when you add one extra point to this guy, then the conjecture remains true. That's sort of the question that I'm looking at. So it's a slightly different version of what I'm saying, uh, uh, the, the original question. However, you can sort of look at it this way. It's known for three points. It's known for two points. When you put those two systems together, will it be true? 
that's the sort of thing that I'm sort of thinking about. So combination of things for which is true, will it be true for those as well? Okay. And uh, I'm not going to go through the detail. It's, uh, it's possible to sort of set this problem up like uh, as uh, almost a linear algebra problem because at the end of the day, for a system like this to be linearly independent, all you need to do is to look at what's known as a Gramian of a system, which is the set of all inner product of this function. If you can prove that this matrix is positive definite, then you're done. And the matrix, by definition, is positive semi-definite, meaning that the smallest eigenvalue is greater or equal to zero. So the question is, can you guarantee that the smallest eigenvalue is strictly positive? That's what you're sort of fighting for here. Okay. So by doing this and uh, using, like, uh, if you have like a system that composed of what you already know and uh, the point, the new point that you're sort of looking at, then you can decompose the Gramian of this new system into a block where this part will be about things that you completely know already. And this vector here will in include all the information about the new point that you're trying to test. So at the end of the day, uh, you can define a function that I call the extension function. And the extension function is just defined for this formula right here. So I'm not giving you exactly what u of a, b is. I don't, I'm not giving you what this is. But this is a Gramian corresponding to the thing that you already know. You know it for n point. So you know that matrix is positive definite, so it's invertible. So looking at this quantity here, and this function turned out to be like a, a function that's always between 0 and 1. It takes the value 1 at every point that you already know. know. It uniformly continues. It goes to 0 at infinity. It's integrated to n. It has very nice property. It's related to the determinant of your, of your matrix via this formula right here. So now, remember, I want to prove that the thing is invertible. So all I need to do is to prove that the determinant is not equal to 0. That sort of amount to sort of showing that this function never takes the value 1. So the function is bounded above by 1. So 1 is your enemy. If you give me a new point, if I can test that the value of the function at that new point is not 1, then the conjecture will be true for that point. And so from that, it's not difficult to see that the HRT, at least the way I look at it here, is a local problem because I can always, because the function goes to 0 at infinity, I can always find a big ball outside of which I can make the function small. Therefore, it's going to be true everywhere outside the ball. So the question is what happened inside the ball, OK? And uh, these are some results that I obtained. And this is like the refinement that I was mentioning earlier. So for every endpoint, if I take a 1, n minus 1 configuration, meaning that n minus 1 of the point are on the line, and then the last one is of the line, then there exists at most uh, one equivalence class. So equivalence class here means that there are transformations that you can do to this configuration. You can translate them. You can shear them. You can scale them. So there is one equivalent class of one n configuration so that this is linearly independent. So the result by uh, when I say almost uh, all one free configuration, here it's a more refined version of that. In fact, I know that there exists only one configuration for which this is not going to sort of be true. So in particular, if I sort of uh, assume that my function is real value, in fact, I can prove that this cannot happen. It's the conjecture will be true when the function is real value. So when the function is real value and I only have like one free configuration, then the HRT conjecture is true. So keep in mind here, I made a big, big assumption here. Instead of taking function that could be complex value, I'm restricting myself to real value function here. Okay. And uh, a few more results. I'm not going to go over this. Um, 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 but you can sort of see that, I mean, there are things that have to happen. So one of the parameters must be rational. The other one can be irrational. In this case, A and B will be irrational but the product has to be rational. So what I meant here is that um, I'm taking a set of four points that have this form. Any set of three points, I can always sort of put them in this form right here using some transformation. So the only thing I'm doing here is like picking a fourth point. So if a fourth point has a, like parameter A and B so that they are rationally dependent, then the conjecture is true. If uh, A is uh, rational and the B is irrational, then it's true. If both are irrational, but the product is rational, then it's also true. Okay. So these are things that I sort of obtained with using the method that I just described. And in particular, for Schwartz functions that are also real value, the conjecture is going to be true essential for any four point. Okay. But here again, look, I made some restriction. I'm looking only at Schwartz class function, but not only that, I require my function to be real value. And with those two conditions, then I can prove that the HRT conjecture is true. Okay. So I don't know how many of you were looking at the question that I had earlier. So we can come back to this now to close the talk. And uh, so you can sort of, uh, so this were the question. So um, 
This one is a one three configuration, as I mentioned earlier. And for one three configuration, it was already proved by Demeter that this is always true if the function is Schroes class. And in fact, it's almost for almost all one three configuration is true. The qu point is, I don't know if this falls into the bad class. However, if I restrict to real value function, then what I just presented shows that this has to be true also for this configuration. For the second one, uh, the difference between this and that one is that it's no longer a 1-3 configuration, it's not a 2-2 configuration. But this is one of the cases where both of the parameters are irrational, but the product is rational. And therefore, in this case, I can prove that the conjecture is true as well for any L2 function. And the last one, um, the last example, this is pi, this is square root of 2, both irrational, but the product is irrational, so I cannot say anything using that. However, if I restrict to function that are Schwarz class, then I know that and the real value, then this has to be true as well. So that's how far or what I have done so far. I'm hoping to sort of work more on this, but uh, uh, you start and you never stop. So I, I spent summers looking at this. There are many interesting questions that you can ask, and I'm hoping some people will get sort of uh, interested in this problem, okay, and spend some time. But if you're a graduate student, I won't sort of advise to do it now. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that's my next one. Okay, so with that, I would like to stop here. Uh, these are some of the references that I use uh, in the talk. Uh, and uh, for that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>